In the basement of the MFA's American wing, near the back hallway in the farthest gallery, quietly stands a masterpiece of American art. If anyone needs a reason to venture down into these neglected galleries, John Foster's headstone should be it. Carved by the Charlestown Stonecutter in 1681, the grave originally stood in Dorchester's North Burying Ground before it was lent to the MFA in 1977 and replaced with this replica. Because Foster was the first printer in Boston, it seems only fitting to begin with the epitaph, which is broken into two parts. The top provides the name, age, and date of death, and humbly reminds us of his aptitude for both intellectual pursuits and manual trade. One thing that immediately stands out is the sharpness of the letters. After enduring over 300 New England winters, the epitaph looks as if it was chiseled yesterday. Graphically speaking, the epitaph incorporates many sophisticated elements. It starts with center alignment in all caps, with ingenious italicized. It then switches to lowercase ragged left. Notice the single story A, the slightly curved stem of the T which sits within the X height, the friendly eye of the E which flows into the M serif, the extended tail of the ampersand, the straight arm of the R ending with that diamond terminal, the wide tracking of the all caps name, the M serif merging with the superscript, the pronounced beak of the F, the broad wingspan of the T, the wide legs of the R, the low jaw of the G, the diagonal stroke of the capital Y, the carrot completing September, the ordinal indicator ligature, and finally the angled double rule line that completes this section. The Latin inscription below is actually a correspondence between John Foster and his friend Increase Mather, indicated by their initials to the left. While Foster was dying from tuberculosis, Mather sent him a touching Latin verse, which alludes to Foster's love for astronomy. Translated, it reads, Living thou studiest the stars, Dying, mayest thou foster, I pray, Mount above the skies and learn to measure the highest heaven. To which Foster replied, I measure it, and it is mine. The Lord Jesus has bought it for me, nor am I held to pay aught for it, but thanks. Note the use of small caps, triangles for periods, ligatures like the diphthong, and the strong M dash at the end. This is a highly unusual epitaph for the Charlestown stonecutter, who typically use centered all caps. Considering the typographic variation, poetic correspondence, and revealing descriptions, there is a high probability that Foster helped design his own stone. The lunette is just as interesting as the epitaph. It depicts Father Time trying to prevent the hand of death from extinguishing the flame of life. The candlestick balances atop a globe with serpent handles and lines for latitude and longitude. The stonecutter based this dramatic narrative on a print from Francis Quarles' Emblems and Hieroglyphics of the Life of Man, printed in 1638. He must have enjoyed this particular image, for he also used it on the Joseph Tapping Stone, carved just three years earlier in 1678. The main difference is the inclusion of the sun, which shines with radiant lines, a cheerful expression, and thinly carved eyelashes. The anatomy of the skeleton is somewhat crude, especially when compared to the 1698 Ruth Carter stone, but it nevertheless conveys a self-taught folk aesthetic that I actually prefer to the accuracy of the latter. Let's now turn our attention to the unconventional borders. The top is comprised of two large blank discs, below which is a single deeply carved acanthus leaf that pinches the top of the epitaph. The border continues with a half flower and more fluttering acanthus scrolls, two of which are connected by an elongated stem that gracefully fills that bottom area. It's important to note that all of these patterns are chiseled lines. Had the stonecutter carved them in relief, the grave would have lost its striking composition, which focuses our attention on the top half of the stone and creates a little stage for the cast of characters in the lunette. Another element not to overlook are those flat side caps that run along the edge of the stone, curve slightly into those circles, and re-emerges as the trim of the lunette. In terms of the stone itself, I've never seen a patina that conveys such a mood. The stone's surface is like a stormy cloud, spotted with charcoal black, cobalt blue, foggy gray, and dusty orange. 
It reminds me of the surface of a Turner painting. Even the sun appears to glow, as if someone rubbed white chalk into those incised lines. Next to the headstone is the footstone, which marked the end or foot side of the coffin. Considerably smaller and less ornate, footstones typically bear the initials of the person buried beneath. This one, however, includes a Latin phrase from the Roman poet Ovid, skill was his cash. If this was the case, then Foster was certainly generous with his wealth. He printed the first medical treatise in America, as well as the first map of New England, the first poems of Anne Bradstreet, and the first illustration of the Copernican system. He redesigned the Colonial Seal of Massachusetts, captured striking portraits, produced cautionary broadsides and religious sermons. His astronomical observations of the 1681 comet were referenced in Thomas Newton's Principia. In just 33 years, Foster became one of the greatest men of his age. Because his gravestone equals the brilliance of his short life, John Foster will forever remain an ingenious figure, even in death.